Hello everyone. Uh, okay, great. We're just starting a few minutes late. Thank you all for turning up to this second session. So can I ask you what was the first one like? Was it okay? Yes. Yeah. Did it teach you new things? Uh, a little bit, but okay. uh, not so in detail. Okay, okay. So, um, that type of discussion, would you normally expect to have that? As students, do you talk like that um, in class? Okay. Yes, some say yes, no? no? Okay, okay. But, when you go out to work with, with patients in hospitals, for example, do you come across issues that could be talked about but aren't? Tell me, what, what, what type of nursing have you done? Is it in the hospital? But what type? What? what? Medical, surgical, orthopedic? Yeah. Recovery. Okay. So, um, but in that case, recovery, operation, recovery, and then discharge somewhere else? Uh, no, the recovery, like a long time of recovery. Oh, okay. Yes. It's not recovery, it's called um, yeah. rehabilitation. 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 Yeah. So, rehabilitation from what? Uh, all kind of, <laughs> kinds of stuff. Like. Uh, Hip. Um, uh, hip. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hip fractures. Yeah. yeah all right. Yeah. Uh, a CVA. Yeah. Yeah. So many of those. Di so many of those different issues. Even those two would bring up sexual health issues. Because usually if it's a hip fracture, are you talking old people, young people? Uh, both. Both? But most old people. Okay, right. So, when you're talking about sexual health with old people, for example, that could be one issue. It could be talking with them. Or supposing a person's got pain. So maybe a person's got um, arthritis. So they could have terrible painful joints and they may say, oh, I don't have sex now because it hurts too much to have sex. Yeah. So it could be something like that, in which case somebody needs to talk about their medication. Maybe they could take medication before having sex to reduce the pain. Or maybe it's even the positions that they have sex in. But if nobody's going to talk to them, how will they ever know about this? Okay, so that's the big point. So yes, this session now is on um, uh, the language and communication again. Feel free to tweet if you want to. You've got your little hashtag there, okay? Are any of you into tweeting? Yeah, just one? Okay, well feel free to tweet, okay? <laughs> Great. Okay, and my, yeah, my contact details are there as well, so feel free to copy me in uh, as well. I've taken out some of the pictures because I didn't realise you would be the same group. So the earlier pictures I showed you about Greenwich, you've already seen, okay? Right, but what I'm hoping we can do in this session is to talk about other stuff. Not just when you mentioned sexual health, because if you talk about sexual health and people think sexual infections, teenage pregnancy, HIV, abortion, that's the usual things that people talk about. But what I'd like us to explore now this afternoon is some of the other things. So it's showing up on the screen here as um, prejudice, taboos, even clarifying meanings. So when one of your colleagues mentioned about genitals and she said, you know, damn it. Yeah? Even clarifying the meanings. Because sometimes people don't even have the words or the language of what to say. What's it like here in Belgium if people want to refer to their genitals? What words do they use? How do they refer to their genitals? Well, penis? Yeah, yeah, okay, so penis females. for males. Yeah, for females? For JJ. Okay, for JJ. 
Vagina. Right. Right. But even the outside of the female genitals are not called the vagina. So how do you call the outside? Labia, yeah, okay, lovely. So it's just finding the language. So labia for the lips, or uh, the, the whole external genitalia, the vulva. But look how clinical these words sound, and how many people. Um, so when you're talking to your patients, how many of them may even know what language to use? And especially when we were all small children, did you have different names for your genitals? Yeah, like what sort of names? <laughs> Say anything? No, I don't know anything, but I don't know the children. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, so the trouble is, if you learn lots of these words when you're little children, but if you don't learn other words as you grow older, you then go to the nurse or the doctor to say you've got a problem with your genitals, and what language are you going to use? So a lot of it is to do with the communication. So here it says we're going to be talking about things like different types of knowledge, taboos, clarification of meaning, and even personal awareness. Okay? And what I'm hoping we can do is to analyse some of the impact that the language causes. So your whole week here is on language. We're going to look at sexual language and the way it impacts on people. Okay? So when you talk about sexual health, these are the things that are often talk, uh, uh, talked about in the UK. So what would you say the main things you talk about in Belgium? If someone says, oh, there's a news item on sexual health on television, what would you expect to hear? Some new disease. Okay, so anything about sexual diseases, new diseases? Have you heard of any new diseases lately? No? Or any changes in diseases? Yes. HIV. Okay, HIV? Yes. Yeah? But there are people who... Uh, uh, yeah, healed. 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 Uh, two people. Okay, yeah, two. Right, and do you know how? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, stem cells? Yes. Yes, yeah. But the big problem with that is it's only two people in the world and there may be 40 million people living with the virus. So it worked for those two. It may not work for other, and it would be too expensive. But something that's really fantastic is all the medication that's available now. And I do a session on that on Thursday, looking at the different medications. So that's really changed. But also, even when you say about sexual diseases, um, quite often now we talk about sexual infections, not diseases, because what's passed is a germ that causes an infection, which may then lead to a disease process, but it, technically it's not a disease that's been passed. And yet, sexual infections used to be called venereal diseases. Did you know that, VD? No? Okay, right, fine. So, these are some of the things. What else might be talked about? Even when you say about the diseases then, um, gonorrhea, have you all heard of gonorrhea? Yeah, it's a simple sexual infection and it can be easily treated with antibiotics. But now there's a problem because some people are becoming resistant to the antibiotics. So although it's not a new disease, what is new is that usually you just give people some antibiotics, now those antibiotics won't work. And if that problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger, within a few years' time, gonorrhea, which you could normally treat, may now become untreatable. And that'll be the first time in over 70 years since before antibiotics were invented. Okay? So that's a new problem. So these are some of the things that we may talk about, but look at the, some of the things that people don't talk about. So what would you say people don't talk about? Normal sex. Okay. Just how it works and all. Right. Yeah. So lots of people don't know how it works. And even with lots of young people, uh, certainly in Britain, a lot of young people today may be watching pornography on the internet. And they think, oh, normal sex means doing it this way or having this number of orgasms because that's what they've seen on the internet. So even when you use the word normal, what does normal mean? Because normal for one person may mean something else for another person. 
Also, another problem with the word normal, if a person says to you, oh, look, well, what I normally do is this, that, and the other, and if you say to them, that's normal, what's the opposite of normal? What would be the opposite of normal? How would you say that? So you can say to one person, look, the sex you're doing, everyone does that, that's normal. But if you then hear somebody doing something that's very, very different, what's the opposite word to normal? Abnormal. Abnormal, yeah? So that's what we say in English, but can you imagine saying that to a person? So that there's also a problem using the word normal. Because if you say to a person, oh, that's normal to do it that way, are you then implying that somebody else may not be normal? So that's a consideration with the language. But let me just show, show you some of these. There was a French philosopher called Michel Foucault, and he came out with this term. He spoke about something that he called a triple edict. So three, three aspects. One of them is if something is a taboo. So can you think of anything about sex or sexuality that you would consider taboo? Something you mustn't talk about. Uh, I think people who get uh, children with IVF. Right. Okay. And wh why would that be a problem then? Um, <coughs> because it seems unnatural. Right. And like with the word normal, so natural. So if, you know, man and woman meet, you do that, you make babies, and you say, oh, that's normal, but the opposite of normal is abnormal, or the opposite of natural is unnatural. So yes, it could be that some people think this is a taboo. Now then, when you think in some world religions, even masturbation is considered a taboo, and some people won't even talk about it. So if it's IVF, the man is gonna have to produce. So how is he gonna do that without masturbating? And if he comes from a religious community that says, well, you shouldn't masturbate, how is he gonna do that? So you might think, well, if I don't, I'll never be able to reproduce through IVF. So now he may be doing something that's um, unnatural for him. So how does he talk about it? And that's why Foucault said that some of these things are considered a taboo. In some, some people can't even talk about it. But if you don't talk about it, no one's mentioning it. So how do you know that it even exists? So when you say about IVF, there could be lots of people in Belgium who have gone through IVF. But if they don't talk about it, you might think, oh no, that's a taboo. We don't mention it, it's silence. And therefore, Foucault says, there's non-existence. So, so does IVF exist in Belgium? Yes. Yes, it does. But if people aren't talking about it, it might give the impression it isn't. So that's one of the things we need to challenge then. When people talk about things that maybe you haven't heard of, and that model I showed you earlier, that explicit model, I'll come back to it later. So it could be that someone tells you something you've never heard of it before, but don't be shocked. If you sit there and cross your arms and legs, or, oh, that sounds awful, then straight away, you've broken communication. Because you've condemned the person. You've judged them by your actions. So even if they tell you something that you find really difficult, still keep that lovely smiling face. Go, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. I actually don't know too much about it, but if, if I have your permission, I can ask some of my colleagues about it. Yeah? So what you've done, you haven't condemned them. You haven't judged them. Does that make sense? Am I talking okay for you all? Yeah, all right? Okay, great. Another thing, when you're considering people or practices or different, they just do it differently to you. And because of that, some people refer to this as being abject. And that word usually means something that's dirty or hidden. So supposing you hear of different sexual practices, somebody tell you, right, so what did you learn in school about normal sex? What would you say that school taught you is normal sex? Go on. Missionaries? <laughs> Missionaries. Missionary. No, missionary, okay. Yeah. So, one person on the, on the bottom and another person on top. Yes? And uh, go on, what did we say? Uh, I think uh, we saw a movie like in a 
the elementary school yeah. with two uh, different persons and they like mentioned it like when like two people love each other like the only thing like we have sex is like love each other right. to uh, make children yes yeah. it's not the normal sex but they teach children yeah, without a doubt. So in that case, if you're a child growing up thinking, well, I can only ever have sex when I fall in love with someone and then get married to them, if they have sex before that, then maybe... Yeah, 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 it's, it's normal. Right, it's not normal. And for some people, they might use it, that's a sin. Mm -hmm. So they might think it's wrong. So all of those things, but even when you mention the missionary position, if people say, well, yes, it's that position, so who normally lies on the bottom and who lies on the top? The girl on the bottom. Girl on the bottom, male on the top, yes. But what about if they do it that way? What about if they swap the position? So when you mentioned about people with hip fractures, or say arthritis, it could be if somebody's doing it in that position, they might be in too much pain. But if they turn over, but then you're saying that it may be seen unnatural. So it could be just changing the positions. Or when this talks about people, practices, or life ways that are seen as abject or dirty, so different sexual practices, when people tell you, oh, I like doing this, or I like doing that, maybe they've seen it on the internet. And if someone says, oh, that's dirty, that's disgusting, that's what the word abject means. So lots of people won't talk about that because they think it may be wrong. Can you think of anything that will be considered abject? Oh, do you, go on. Giving a blowjob. Okay, giving a blowjob. And even when you use language, so it's so a blowjob, that's been performed on who? On the it's been performed on the boy, okay? And even when you're talking about it, so oral sex, even when you're using language like that, or, oral sex or masturbation, most of the words are the boy's words. Even when people consider masturbation, lots of the words may be the boy's words. But can't females masturbate? Can't females have oral sex performed on them? But the language may not be there for some. Yeah? Okay, lovely, brilliant. Right, so when you think of all the different hospital settings you work in, is there anything about sex or sexual health that you think the hospital should talk about, but they're not? So any of the clinical settings you've gone to. Have any of you worked in midwifery? Any midwives? No, all nurses. Okay, so can't talk to me. What other things do you come across and you go on? I uh, had a pretty young girl on the yeah, dating, and uh, she uh, would like her boyfriend to stay over, but the hospital didn't allow it, so he had to leave, but she really didn't want to, also because she was scared, but yeah. Then I thought, yeah, why can't he just stay? And why couldn't he then? What was the excuse that was given? The visitors have to leave at 8 o'clock. But see, in the earlier session, you said about caring for clients holistically. So if her holistic needs, if she said, look, I'm frightened, I'm scared of being in hospital alone. I want someone with me. Can't the rules be broken? But is it that they're frightened that if a boy and girl stay together, something might happen? Is that what they're fearful of, do you think? I think, yes. Yeah, that okay. That was the real problem. Yeah. And was that from an individual nurse? or doctor, or are they saying it's hospital policy? Yeah, no, it was um, one nurse that sent the boy out, but then um, at the briefing, everyone um, agreed with her. Okay. He had a good job, right. he did a good job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. So, the hospital, the services that you go and work at, they could actually be doing more. So say, for example, with the, the situation you've given now, if they sat down as a team and discussed this, and said, right, if this happens again, how will we deal with it? Because what are they frightened of? Say, for example, if you had a person that was in hospital for a long time, and they're missing their partner, could the partner come in and could they have some privacy? Or supposing they're in a, a, a private room of their own, 
Do you have to knock the door first to go in? Yeah? And would you wait to be invited in? Or do you just knock and walk in? And what happens if they're doing something in there? Yeah? Are any of you mental health nurses? No mental health? No all general. Okay? Because sometimes on, me, um, on some mental health units, it could be that the clients start forming relationships together. And what's going to happen if they want to go to each other's rooms? Or what happens if it's an old person in an old people's home and their partner comes in? So when you mention somebody with a CVA, supposing someone's had a CVA and now they can't go back home to live, so they go to live in, in a rehabilitation home. And their partner comes in to visit them every afternoon. And the partner says to you, look, the thing I miss is every afternoon, my partner and I, we used to lie on the bed together and maybe just kiss and cuddle. I really miss that. Can I do that now? And your ward might say, oh no, we don't allow that here. So what do you do? You make sure that you police them. So that means you go up, you knock the door and you walk in quickly without being invited in. Whereas if you said to them, well look, if you want some private time, then we know if your door is closed, we knock and we wait for a response. That's treating them respectfully. It's enabling them to do this. But supposing the person with the CVA, supposing that person can't talk very well now, and the partner comes in and says to you, every afternoon we used to lie on the bed together and we used to get close and have a bit of fun. But how do you know that your patient is consenting? Because if they can't communicate, you've only got the other partner's word for this. So how do you know that's not now abuse going on if there's no consent? So communication is really important. So you might hear it from the one person, but it's also important to get consent from the other one as well. Okay? Which if they have a CVA and can't talk, then how will they communicate that to you? Another issue could be with dementia. It could be a person's coming in saying, my partner and I, we normally made love every afternoon. But if the person doesn't know, how do you know they're consenting? Okay? So that's what your services could be exploring. How do we deal with people who have got dementia, who may want to have sex, but we don't know because we don't know what their mind is? Okay, can you see the point I'm trying to make there? Yeah, is that all right? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, and I'm not asking you to tell me, but just thinking in your own minds. Are there any things that you would find difficult? for people to talk to you about. So if you were working with a patient and they started telling you about certain things, are there certain things that you would find difficult to listen to? Because that's really important. I'm not asking you to tell me, but it's really important for you to acknowledge that. Because with that explicit model, the one bit of it talks about personal self-awareness. So us, ourselves. So if somebody started telling me about certain things, and if I found that difficult, I mustn't dump my feelings on the client. I'm not there for me, I'm there for them. But I may have to go work through this myself. Because say, for example, if, it was, if a client's talking to you about sexual abuse, and supposing a nurse has been sexually abused themselves, then they might, fi they might find that very hard to be listening to this from someone else. But at the end of the day, you're there for the client. So that listening means you have to listen to yourselves as well. Okay, so really important if you find something difficult. It may be that you find it difficult because you don't know too much about it. Or sometimes you may be shocked. Now, because I've been teaching sexual health um, for a long time, I don't think I get shocked. <clears throat> but sometimes I might get a bit disappointed. And I was very disappointed a few months ago when um, one student, she was 18, and she'd just come straight from school, straight into nursing. And she said the school she went to, a lot of the boys used to try and have sex with as many girls as possible so they could brag about it to all their friends. So I've heard that a million times, that didn't shock me at all. But the thing that did upset me was the language that she said they used. 
Do you know what a body bag is? You know when someone dies, you know, if you see war happening, and or even in hospitals then, when someone dies and they get put into a body bag, yeah? She said the language that the boys at her school used, when they would say, instead of saying, oh, I've had sex with six or 26, instead of boasting about it like that, they would talk about it as body bagging. And they would talk about it as their body count. So if they've had sex with 12, they say, I've bagged 12. And it just sounded so awful, the way they were putting women down, just by talking about it as body bagging. Yeah? So I found that really um, sort of upsetting that people would use that language. But I couldn't let that come across in the classroom. And if a person was telling me, oh, I go out and I'm body bagging, I can't let that come across because I must keep that professional distance. Yeah? Because that would be my upset, not theirs. So it's really important that we start to acknowledge this. So if this is something you do find difficult, that's absolutely fine. Be kind to yourselves on this. But it's something for you to work on, not your clients. Yeah, is that making sense? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, there's Michel Foucault, and there's what he said about the triple edict. But also there was something else really important he said. He said, why do we still burden ourselves today? So when we're talking about sex, why do we still have this old hang-up about talking about sin? Because for so many people it's in relation to, um, in, in relation to their religion, uh, even contraception. So in the UK, for example, some Roman Catholics would not use contraception because they think, well, no, my church says I shouldn't do that. But Protestants haven't got that issue. So there'd be a very big difference between the religions there, okay? Now, let me ask you this. I mentioned earlier about the word sexual orientation. So what's the difference between sexual orientation and sexual preference? What's the difference between those two words? If you prefer something, what does that mean? Go on. Do you like something more than the other thing? Yeah. You one? Yeah. But where there's a problem in sexual language is that sometimes people get these two things confused. So sexual orientation is who you are. If you're heterosexual, gay, bisexual, that's your orientation. Whereas your preference is what you like. So you might say, well, what I like is doing it in that position. What I like is being dressed head to toe in rubber or jumping off the wardrobe to have sex. That's your preference, okay? But where there's a difficulty, so supposing a young child comes home, uh, say a teenager comes home from school and says, mum, there's something I need to tell you, I'm gay. If the parent thinks that's a preference, they might think, well, we didn't bring you up to be like that. So change. They might think you can just change because it's a preference. It's something you choose. Whereas orientation is not what you choose. So there's a big difference. So be careful how you use those two words. So sexual orientation is somebody's sexuality, whereas their preference might be what they like to do in sex. Okay? Is that all right? Yeah, great. Okay, and that's just a little picture. Um, and this one comes from a, a, um, a big LGBT organisation in the UK. And it is in sexual orientation is not a choice. So you don't choose, you don't wake up one day and think, oh, I'm going to be bisexual or I'm going to be gay. Let me tell you a very quick story on bisexual. Um, quite a few years ago, I was teaching British military people. And up until that time, it was against the law for lesbians and gays to be in the armed forces. So it's changed now, but up until, I think it was 2000 or something, if you were lesbian or gay, you couldn't be out about your sexuality in the armed forces. If it was known, you'd be sent out to the armed forces. And I had to work with all these soldiers and sailors, and I had to do a day on sexuality issues. And I realized it was gonna be very difficult for them. So I said to them, Okay, so what do you all know about lesbian women? And some of the things they told me, they said, well, they've all got short hair, they wear flat shoes, they're overweight, and they're all senior officers in the army. 
And it was like every woman in the room they were describing. And when I said, and what about gay men? A lot of the men sat there, they folded their arms, they wouldn't look at me at all, and they were saying, we haven't got them in our part of the army, they're just in other parts of the army. Or if they were in the, in the navy, they were saying, we don't have any on our ships. So they were being very, very difficult to get through to. And I said, and what about bisexuals? And nobody answered. There was total silence. So I said, well, look, it sounds to me as if you think you know what lesbians are like, you think you know what gay men are like, but you're not too sure about bisexuals. And there was total silence. So I said, well, okay, I'll let you into a little secret. I said, I'm bisexual. And the room went really quiet. I said, I like soldiers and sailors. And with that, <laughs> with that they all burst out laughing. And it took something like that. So humour is going to be really good. So when you're talking with your clients, they may be very shy or embarrassed. And especially if it's an older person, with you as a younger person, they might think, I can't talk to you about this. You know, it's not right for an old person to talk to a young person. So sometimes using humour may break through some of those barriers. So never be frightened to laugh. Don't laugh at the client, but it's okay to laugh with them, okay? Because sometimes they may tell you things and they might say, I'm mean, very embarrassed telling you this. And all of a sudden they're laughing and they're giggling. Even when you do sex education in school, do, do boys laugh more than girls about sex ed in school? No? Not here. Okay. In the UK, our school nurses, they often say they have a real big difficulty in mixed groups because they say the girls are very serious. They want to know all about it. They want to find out about contraception, safer sex. The girls are very serious. But the boys, they never take it seriously. They're always laughing and joking and messing around. But I would say maybe the boys are embarrassed. And maybe the laughter is because of their embarrassment. So if somebody is laughing, work with that, okay? Okay, so with sexual orientations, and these are some of the terms, some of the letters, look how long this list is getting now. And there are other words coming in as well. So have you heard of words like bicurious? Yeah, okay, so bicurious. That could be someone who says, oh no, I'm straight, you know, I'm a man, I've got a girlfriend, but sometimes I wonder what it's like to have sex with another man, but I've never done that. So that's what you would refer to as bicurious. So somebody who may think about it, but they haven't done anything. And in a way, that could be like this new word, this is quite new now, heteroflexible. Somebody might say, no, I'm heterosexual, but... Here's a summary from Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a summary from Wikipedia. <laughs> she was listening to me. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Sorry. and do you know the pop singer Robbie Williams? Robbie Williams says he's trisexual because he's prepared to try anything at least once. Okay, so that's where that word comes from. And this list, look how long it's getting all the time. Sometimes you'll see a Q on it. Now, what does the Q stand for? Well, one, one of the options is on the screen in front of you. What does Q stand for? It could be questioning. It could be somebody that says, well, actually, I'm still a virgin. I haven't had sex with anybody yet, so I'm just not too sure. So it could be questioning. But also, that word could also stand for queer. So when I was a child, queer was a really abusive term to use. If you said to someone, oh, you're such a queer, it was a very negative term to use. But now, many lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people reclaim that word. Because they say, right, if I call myself queer, and if you shout at me, oh, you bloody queer, it's not going to offend me, because I like the word. So that's what's called a reclaimed word. So some people do talk about being queer. Also, there are whole academic disciplines. You can do master's degrees and doctorates in queer theory. So there's queer theory, queer spirituality, queer counselling. It's a particular way of looking at things. So that's where the word Q comes in there. Okay? Now, um, Different sexual, look at this lovely little picture here. Right, okay. So, are there particular sexual words that you would be unsure of or find difficulty in talking about? 
So if you come across any terms that you're prepared to call out now, any terms you'd find difficult, even if you don't know what it means. It's so riding a horse without a saddle. What, this one, barebacking? Is this riding a horse without a saddle? What does barebacking mean? Have you come across this term? Barebacking is, um, well, especially in gay communities, in, in English, um, yeah, in English language, barebacking means um, anal intercourse without a condom. So two men having sex together without a condom. And this is where negative judgments can come in. Because supposing someone says, oh, look, I really like barebacking. And someone, a, a nurse might say, well, aren't you worried about infections? Or haven't you heard about HIV? Why don't you use condoms? So straight away, if you come across in a sort of judgmental way, it could be quite negative. Because if our parents had never their backed in penis vagina, of course, none of us would be sitting here today, unless it was IVF. Okay, so the heterosexual world has always done the barebacking. They've always gone without condoms. But for other communities, there's always an expectation that you must practice safer sex, for example. Talking of condoms, has anybody ever done a condom demonstration in front of you before? Yeah? So do you all know how to put condoms on? Everyone? Because I've got one here, I can show you. <laughs> yes. Right, you know I mentioned this morning, when I went to that university in Bahrain, and um, I went to do a condom demonstration, and one of the female nurses, she said, oh David, we don't need to see this, thanks. So I thought she meant, because they're all nurses, they all know how to do a condom demonstration. So I thought, I better just check this out. And I said, why don't you need to know? And she said, well, if God intends you to get HIV, you'll get it. If he doesn't, you won't. Now, we all live in very multicultural worlds. So I can't go up to every patient and say, look, use this, it could protect you from a whole load of sexual infections, unplanned pregnancies, HIV, use this. Because someone might say, I can't, my religion says I can't. Or what about myths or errors about sex? Have you heard any old stories. Did your granny ever tell you anything? Yeah? What about things like masturbation? What messages have you received? It makes you deaf. Makes you deaf and makes you blind? And yeah, that's why I have big hearing aids. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and, and you lose your hair. Yeah, go on. Uh, I, when I was a kid, I used to and only boys do it. Mm -hmm. It's like a stereotype Yeah, and um, which words would be used for masturbation, and are they the boys' words? Um. Yeah, so does that just mean boy stuff? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, even from the point of view of gender differences, the language is different. Okay? Let me just get back to condoms a minute, because it's important to do this, because you could be working with clients who may say, well, look, I've been brought up being told not to use condoms, so I've never used one. I don't know how to do it. And you might say to them, well, didn't the teacher show you at school, or the nurse? And they might say, I didn't listen, because I thought I couldn't use them. So it's important to know, okay? Right, so this condom, it's in date, and it's got the European CE sign on there. So that means it's a good condom, I trust this, okay? Now, don't use your teeth, because if you use your teeth, you could damage it. Don't keep it in your bag with all your sharp keys or something. That could damage it. So they need to be treated respectfully. So I've got a condom there, and there's a little wobbly edge on the top. Okay, a little serrated edge. So if you just push the condom to one side and tear down the serrated edge. When it comes out, some condoms, but not all of them, some have got a little teat. So you always need to pinch the end just to get the air out of it. Okay, because that's another problem. Condoms are really good and they should protect about 99.9%. .9%. But they fail more often because the boys and the men. Because boys and men don't put them on properly. So one thing to do, you must get rid of the air. Then, 
he needs to be like that. If he's saying, oh no, I'm too shy, I'm too embarrassed, I can't do this, or I need another pint of lager first, you've got to do something because he needs to be like that. Okay, right. Put this on and roll that down to the base of the penis. Okay? It needs to be down. Now, when you think of the excuses that boys and men give, <laughs> oh, they don't fit, they're too tight, they're choking me, um, I'm allergic to rubber. You know, or if you really trust me, if you love me, these are all the excuses the boys and the men may use. Right, but that's an average size condom, okay? If you need a really small one, you can get micro condoms and you can get um, magnum and super magnum. So no matter what size they are, there's a condom for everyone somewhere, okay? Right, when it's all over, what do you do with the condom? So he's gonna take it off, what do you do with it then? Yeah, make a knot in it, and then throw it way, way. Yeah, in the trash. Okay, so maybe you can wrap it in a bit of toilet paper or something, and just throw it in the bin. Go on. No, I wanted to ask, why is it necessary to make a knot in it? Just so the semen won't slip back out. Because um, if you didn't put the knot in it now, if you throw that in the bin, you're gonna have the semen slipping out. Okay, so it, just for practical reasons. So do that. But the important thing is throw it in the bin because if you throw it in the toilet, your mother will come home and find it floating, okay? Because they don't flush. So it'll keep on floating and you flush and it'll keep on floating. And if it does go out to sea, it'll choke the poor dolphins. So never throw them down the toilet. Another important thing is it's really important to use water-based lubricants. Okay, so KY Chelly, water-based lubricants. So the tighter the hole it's going into, the more lubrication. So when one of your colleagues said this morning about an old person, supposing it's an old woman well after the menopause, her vagina might be quite dry. So she might say, well, no, I gave up having sex because my vagina's dry and it hurts me. But if she just uses water-based lubricant, that would give her the lubrication that she needs. But if you use oil on this, or petroleum, so Vaseline, do you have Vaseline? Yeah, if you use that, sometimes in class, if I've got that on my hand, I'll say to people in class, has anyone got Vaseline? And if you said to me, yes, you have, I'd say, do you mind if I put my fingers in there? And if I put my fingers in, I walk around the room, and by the time I get to about here, the condom will explode. And it's a really good visual image to people. Don't use any oil, because it'll rot a condom. So if somebody uses oil, baby lotion or something, they start having intercourse, within about 30 seconds, it'll explode inside the person. Okay, so, is that okay? Yeah? Did you know that? No? Okay. So it's water-based lubricant. Right, I mentioned this morning the word stigma. Can you remember what I said it was? What's the word stigma mean? Mark. Yeah, a mark, literally, it's a Greek word. It's an ancient Greek word. It literally means a mark. So supposing I was a wheelchair user. If I come in here now in a wheelchair, there's the mark, there's the sign. I'm in a wheelchair. It's just a mark. But quite often, when the word's used now, it's got negative meanings. So say, for example, somebody because of their ethnicity, or their age, or their abilities. If people discriminate against them, it's because there's a mark or a sign, okay? Um, can you think of any stigmas? Anything at all? What would you say is stigmatizing? <coughs> any ideas? Stigmas? How about, Say, for example, somebody with certain physical disabilities, you can see the disability, and, <clears throat> oh, have you ever cared for anyone with a stoma? Mm -hmm. A colostomy, yeah. right. So that, that is, a, some people may say, is a stigmatized thing. Because people might say, it's taboo, or we don't want to talk about this. So therefore, it's being treated as a stigma, it's negative. But imagine, if you've just been given a colostomy, how sexy are you going to feel with your colostomy? How are you going to start having sex again? What happens if your colostomy starts working whilst you're having sex? All these worries and concerns. So someone might think, oh no, I've had this colostomy done, so I'm not gonna have sex now. But the problem with stigma 
is some stigmas are visible. So if somebody has um, a facial disfigurement, you can see it straight away. But if someone's wearing a colostomy, you won't know about that unless they come out about it, unless they tell you. So supposing it's a person and they, they go up to someone in a bar, they're chatting away, maybe they start get, get, uh, um, getting on together really well, and at some point, maybe sex is gonna happen. Maybe that night, maybe six months, maybe, tw don't know when. But at what point do they tell them, I'm wearing a stoma, I've got a colostomy. When do they tell them? So that's where there's a difficulty. If somebody feels that there's something stigmatizing about them, it puts the onus on them to come out about it. But if they're gonna be frightened of being rejected, they might not want to come out about it. But then if they leave it too late, the other person may not trust them. So supposing it's a condition like HIV. So if a person's got HIV, and especially if they're taking the medication now, once the virus goes so low in their bloodstream that it's undetectable, then they are uninfectious. They cannot pass that on to someone else. But if they've got HIV and it's undetectable, do they have to tell another person? And if they don't, if they start having sex with them, because they right, I'm uninfectious. But maybe they're using condoms anyway. So they're using condoms, but they're uninfectious, and they think, right, so I don't need to tell you the person. But supposing someone else comes up to that individual and says, the person you're having sex with, they go to the HIV clinic. So they've been outed by somebody else. So with stigma, that's the difficulty. If it's something, something physical that you can see, you can't hide it. If it's the color of our skin, we can't hide the difference in the color of our skin. So some marks, some signs are out. But if they conceal things, the onus is often on the individual on how they come out about it. Is that making sense? Yeah, anything you want to say? No, you all right? I can see we're running really low on time. We, we, we got to 4.30, is that right? Five yeah. minutes. Five minutes. So, let me skip down towards the end. But look, there's tons. What I'll do, I'll make this all available for you all, okay? But I really want to just stick on this little model that I mentioned to you earlier. So Carl and Wendy will have um, some, uh, an article on this, so please feel free to read that article. Uh, but this is what it's talking about, the model. So have you ever heard of this before? Plicit or explicit? No? Okay. So plicit was invented in the 1970s. So it was just P for permission giving, LI for limited information, SS, specific suggestions, and IT, intensive therapy. That just means, oh, I can't deal with this anymore, I don't know enough, I need to refer them to someone more knowledgeable. That was plicit. But it was seen to be very linear, as if, okay, I've given the permission, now I've given the information, now I've made the suggestions, now I've done the intensive therapy. But it should never be like that. So Taylor and Davis, these two people here, they put it into this circle. But the outside bit is for us. So you don't just have to use this in sex. It could be to do with anything in life. Even if you're dealing with, um, say, death and dying. Maybe you're doing palliative care and people want to talk to you about death and dying. Or sometimes it's a taboo. Some people may not even know. When I was a young student nurse, if anybody went to hospital and if they had cancer in lots of places, They'd go to theatre, they'd be opened up, and if the surgeon said, oh, they've got cancer all over, they would literally be cut, closed up, and they'd probably be sedated on morphine and never ever recover again, and they would die. Or if they, were, if they did recover, um, the family might be told what they've got, but the patient would never be told. Cancer was a dreaded word that wouldn't be spoken about. So you can use this whenever people are talking about anything that's difficult to talk about, okay? And it means you start off with permission giving. But be very careful, don't use closed questions. Don't say, look, it seems to me you've got something very personal to tell me at the moment. Would you like to tell me now? That's a closed question. Because if they say, no, no thanks, how'd you get out of that? 
So say you're working with men with type 1 diabetes. Have you worked with any men, with, or with any people with diabetes? Yeah, okay, some of you have. So, for every man with type 1 diabetes, one in every two will have problems with erections, erectile dysfunction. So if you're an expert in diabetes care, you may be fantastic talking about blood glucose and how to test your, your blood. You may be perfect at that. But if you don't say to them, look, one in two men with diabetes have uh, problems with erections. How is this affecting you at the moment? Now see, that's an open question. If you said, one in two men get erectile dysfunction, have you got it at the moment? If a man's too proud to admit it, he might say, no, it's not bothering me at all. You've got a closed, closed answer. So you need to open it up. Say, look, one in every, that's half the class. If this was all men, and if everyone here had type 1 diabetes, 50% of the class would have erectile dysfunction. So if you said to them, so how is it affecting you at the moment? It's an open-ended question. And they might say, well, it isn't. Well, I didn't think it was until you mentioned it to me. But now as you mention it, maybe I am getting some problems. But not just diabetes, it could be stress, it could be drinking too much alcohol, recreational drugs, lots of things. Okay? So that's the important one there to start off with, the permission giving. And if the man says to you then, well, yes, I have got some problems, so what can I do about it? You might say, well, look, I can give you an information leaflet first, so you can find out more. Then when you come back and see me next week, let's talk even more, and if you need to go and see somebody else, I can refer you. Okay? So you've processed that. <coughs> but the important thing here is to look at the outside. So be, be aware of all of this. Do you do much on reflection? So, as reflective practitioners. So it's important to reflect as a session is happening with your client and maybe think about it afterwards. So you might think, well, did that go well? How did it go? Was the person engaged? Did I answer all their questions? So that's you reflecting on it afterwards. And especially if you think, oh, look, I could have mentioned this, I could have done that, then you know what to do better next time. And that's why it's important to look here. But also with knowledge, especially from the sex point of view, if you think, well, look, I've done this session now, so I've heard words like LGBT, but I don't know much about any of this, go and find out more. So if you notice there's anything, or old people, can old people still have sex? Go and find out about it. Anything that we've mentioned that you're not sure on, boost your knowledge. Okay? So whenever you learn something new and you think, well, I don't know as much as I should, always go and learn more from it. And the final one then is challenging those assumptions. And quite often the assumptions around sex may be, oh, no, I can't talk to you. You're going to think I'm terrible or you'll think I'm disgusting. Suppose he's an, an old woman talking to a young man or an old man talking to a young woman. Now, in some cultures, that may not be allowed. We've got lots of Asian nurses, and some of the young Asian females say in their culture they can't talk to old Asian males about sexual health. So there's a cultural problem. But supposing that Asian female is now working in a sexual health clinic, and an old Asian man comes in, if she's the nurse that's on, she's the one that has to talk about it. So if the man says to her, well, I can't talk to you, in our culture it's not allowed. She might say, yes, but you've come to a sexual health clinic because you've got a sexual problem. I'm the one that can help you. Shall we talk about it now? So straight away, she's disarming the challenge that's coming there. Does that seem to make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that all right? Okay, look, we've run to time. Let me just click to the very last one. Yeah, that's it. That's what I say. Thank you to all of you. So I hope these two sessions have been okay. <laughs> are you normally quiet like this or do you talk a lot quiet. you are quiet so, so this is normal is it yeah it's not abnormal okay well thank you all very much
I wish you well with your careers. And if you want to chat about any of this, please contact me on Twitter or feel free to email me. If there's any articles you want from me, I've written loads. If there's stuff you want, just say and I can send you stuff. Is that okay? And I'll try and make all these recordings available for you all. Is that all right? Yes, thank okay, you. thank you all very much.